So we can't not start with COVID because we've all been living like this for the last two and a half years. And um, so I, I'd love to start out, um, and Warren, I'm just gonna start with the other end of the table. I, I'd love to know what your thoughts are with respect to both the economic and long-term producing effects of COVID. Unbelievably challenging. Um, I would say on the various shows I produce, we spend up to a million dollars an episode on COVID um, considerations. Uh, testing, uh, health, safety, all of the protocols. Um, individual studios are now reaching a billion dollars in testing costs. Um, so uh, that's a burden. And I think we're still learning how to protect, be safe, and also create the content that we wanna create. Um, and we are very much a work in progress, I think as um, each and every month we have um, new complications, just when we think we've got it figured out, just when we think um, season four of Handmaid's Tale, we had a little over 70,000 tests and we had 11 positives. Um, and pretty much we were the safest place on the planet if you were working <laughs> on the Handmaid's Tale. Um, season five didn't look like that at all because the world changed. And everyone in the world who just went to work and went home now had options. The world opened up and uh, the variants changed. So um, I feel like we have a incredibly responsible industry who each and every day is struggling with how to keep our arms wrapped around it. And I think on a corporate level, they're struggling with um, should productions continue to be compliant with all the regulations and does that make sense? And, and I think that's, uh, that's a debate that continues each and every day. And so that's the perfect segue to Duncan, um, <laughs> who um, Duncan and I were sort of on speed dial with each other all through the beginning of the pandemic before we had protocol set up in place. And this is the man who has been really making sure that we have safe sets. So Duncan, I'd love to know your thoughts on where that's going. You know, it's great to hear from Warren uh, because I think you know that everyone has a different perspective on how COVID has sort of impacted the industry. But I think we can all agree that um, the most important thing that we did was find a way to get on the same page about how to restart production. Because <clears throat> even though I know we all want to kind of forget about it because it's, you know, it's a traumatic experience for all of us, let's not forget that film and television and streaming production was basically shut down for almost six months uh, from March of 2020 until uh, almost the end of September of 2020 while we were trying to find that, that path forward. And so, um, so I do think it's important to acknowledge what you said, Warren, that the industry did step up as part of that process alongside the unions to find that, that way forward. And I think doing it together was so crucial because if we would have had, uh, you know, th there are four, essentially four union groups that together came together to negotiate with all the companies. If those would have all been done separately and we would have had different rules for different types of workers and different studios and different productions, I don't think the industry could have come back, honestly. I think it would have been chaos. Uh, now, of course, things have evolved. The protocols have evolved. Uh, and I think everyone's mindful of the costs that have been incurred to keep our set safe. On the other hand, um, it's really important for people, and I, I can speak for actors because I literally talk to them all day long. I am, uh, live with one, so, you know, I mean, it's 24-7 for me. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to create another world when you're scared for your own safety, right? It's hard to create another world when you think that you yourself may become seriously ill, that you yourself may bring something back to an immune-compromised family member, et cetera. And so, um, and it's important to recognize that in the case of performers, there are things that performers are asked to do that no other worker in this country is expected to do. Um, I mean, the obvious example being intimate scenes, but there are other examples as well. So I do, um, I, I really respect the uh, investment that the industry has made in safety as part of this process. And I think it's really important that that is always done as a collaborative effort. Um, as many of you know, we're in the process right now of, of working through what an extension to the return to work agreement that's governed all of this should look like. 
Uh, and so that's not done yet. But I do think um, it's fair to say that, uh, especially on the part of the, the companies, the big companies involved, there are different perspectives on how to approach that. The companies are not all of one mind. I mean, I know this for a fact from my conversations with them. And so that's um, taking some time to work through. But I think we all uh, can recognize that uh, as much as we would like the pandemic to be over, it is not over. Uh, I'm constantly reminded by our epidemiologist, who would have thought we would have an epidemiologist on speed dial, and yet we have two. Um, and I'm constantly reminded that as much as some things have opened up, as much as the world has changed in certain ways, um, that you know, we're in an environment where hundreds of people are dying every day from COVID still. Uh, we're in an environment where LA County Health Department, as an example, um, noted that for the first six months of 2022, up until June of 2022, deaths from COVID here in Los Angeles County were greater than, than deaths from motor vehicle accidents, drug overdoses, and the flu combined. So while we transition into a new, a new world order as it relates to COVID, we have to also recognize that it's not an environment where we can just say, oh, the pandemic's over and let's just move on because we do have people who are required by their jobs to do things that are very, make them very vulnerable and compared to workers in any other industry. I will also just say being on sets every day, I feel so grateful for, I mean, you were talking about the cost of the, that the studios have incurred and I, I think the investment in that pays tremendous dividends because you don't have to, exactly as you said, you don't have to worry about where was someone last night if you're, if it's actors that are unmasked or if you're in the cast zone. I think that the vigilance has actually really been freeing because everyone can come and feel relaxed and safe and able to do their very best work. Um, so I, I think it's really a game changer, you know, just in terms of being able to truly return to work. I, I, think, I think it's been great. And I think, I also will say the health and safety teams are like heroes. They don't have an easy job. Nobody's happy about wearing a mask. Nobody's happy about having to test. But I think that they really show up every day and they do stuff that's so important. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, I, I feel very grateful to them for that. They're amazing. They, they easily put in 18, 18 plus hour days. Um, they're an uh, amazing group of people um, looking out for all of us. Um, let's talk about the uh, the way that, so as a writer, um, whatever is going on in the world, I'm processing it through my writing generally before I even know how I feel. I'm looking at you because I'm going to start the question with you. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> like an, a, a quick example that's not about like COVID or the end of Row. A few years ago, I was writing a show called The Magicians and we had this like horned god who was an asshole. And I realized that I was writing about Trump. Like, I, I don't know why it took me so long, but one day I watched the dailies and I was like, oh, we're all processing this presidency through. So you see a good deal of material and you hear what people want to develop next. So I'll, I'll just start with you, but I'm really curious about your observations of how people are starting to process this stuff that has been happening for the last year or two. Well, it's interesting because I think there is a lot of conversation around, do we want to address COVID? Do we want to be living in a COVID world my observations are that people don't want to be living in a COVID world because we lived there. And so what it is now is actually trying to, I mean, I, I think where the crawdads sing is a perfect example of a woman who was in isolation and who really had to dig deep and find herself and advocate for herself and really sort of carve her own place in this world. Um, and I, I think that all of us, I mean, I'm, I'm making a generalization, but I think many of us post COVID, it was sort of like we all felt quite isolated. And then we had to bravely come back out into the world and find ourselves again and find each other again. And I think, you know, there is, I think it's extraordinary that we get to do what we get to do because through art and through expression, we can find catharsis and we can find connection. I do find that people are looking for joy mm -hmm. more than sadness in the work. You know, I think that there's a lot of conversation about, you know, that one of the things that we talk about at Hello Sunshine is we always want there to be an element of hope, that hope is an essential ingredient and the journey can be challenging, but we, we hope that the ending will be hopeful. And, you know, I, I think that hope is something that people are looking for in the world and in their content. So, um, you know, it's something that we're always looking for at Hello Sunshine. Yeah. And to add to that, um, the joyfulness that everybody is looking for right now is something that we at Madison Walls have very much been 
trying to uh, assess as we're looking at new material and you know we produce the eyes of Tammy Faye and that very much was that uh, escape and I think a lot of people um, right now are drawn to that sort of material. So in a not happy, and by the way, a sentence that I can't believe I would ever say, which is in a post-Row world, which is sort of shocking to me, um, I'd love to know, and Rachel, I'd like to start with you, how are you thinking about both the content that you're making and also locations in order to make sure that you're protecting women's health? Yeah. Well, again, our company is very much wanting to tell stories about women from all different backgrounds. So obviously this is something that <laughs> is, is important to us. Um, you know, as a producer, it is my responsibility and also my joy in protecting the crew, the cast, and making sure that they're as healthy and safe as possible. And so that's gonna be my focus and I'm gonna continue to endeavor to do that, so. Thank you. And so I'd love for you to talk about, Tasva, about <laughs> um, your experience would be incredibly helpful for people to hear. In regard to that issue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I work on a show that is shot in Oklahoma entirely. And uh, we know that that was one of the states that has a very strict ban on it. Um, and we are also an indigenous-led show of writers, creators, actors, lead cast. We shoot on the Muscogee Creek Nation. We employ a lot of native folks in Oklahoma. And so in that way for us, like, we sort of have to look at it as the tribes in Oklahoma, which there's a lot and they're very powerful as being sovereign the sovereign nations that they are and to and for us to not take away from the economic contributions we make to those nations and to those people and to tell this story in an authentic way which also puts us in a in a, in a, a strange place you know we have um, an actress of ours who is the only reason I'll speak about it is because she was public about it, but she experienced um, an ectopic uh, pregnancy and she's First Nation, she was in Canada, but it did really make her reflect that like, if she wasn't in an area who was willing to um, service something like that, like what kind of position would that have put her in? Now, luckily Oklahoma is a state where they still will, will allow um, ectopic pregnancies to be taken care of, but I think it was like, it really kind of shook us and the women on set of thinking like, are we in a space where we'd be taken care of? Um, and then also like how do we balance that with keeping work in the tribal communities that of the stories we tell and the work and the people that we're employing. So I think it's like a very nuanced um, conversation in, in terms of, 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 of where we choose to produce. And for us, we just can't do it anywhere else. <laughs> like we, we truly can't, we can't create Oklahoma anywhere else and we don't want to take away those opportunities from, um, from indigenous folks over there. Um, you know, and then there, at that time though, I remember when we were shooting in Oklahoma is when this went through and there was talk of, you know, can tribes uh, perform abortions in, within the state of Oklahoma? They can't technically because it can't come from federal funding, which our Indian Health Services mm -hmm. are through federal funding. So, but it created a lot of just like interesting conversations in terms of like political uh, jurisdictions and things like that. And so um, I had shared that with them on our prep call because I think it's um, a perspective that maybe we're not always um, con considering in, in where we're shooting. And I think that's to say that it's, for our show particularly, it's important. I don't place that on anybody else's. Um, shows or productions. I think it is so fucking crazy <laughs> that we are having a conversation about where people can get treatment for an ectopic pregnancy. Yeah. I know we've all said that a thousand times, but I just can't let it go by. Yeah. Um, Tazba, you were just talking about just the, the things that are special about your show and why it's not so easy to relocate. You yeah. and I were talking about casting and finding writers and yeah. si since you've worked on like not one but two at the same time, which is a flex. Um, <laughs> I was very tired last, <laughs> <laughs> last fall. <laughs> the exhaustion is the flex. <laughs> yeah. uh, we were talking about how like uh, in terms of like centering characters and also bringing in writers who bring authenticity and experience, um, Diversity and inclusion is incredibly important to everybody on this panel. It's in the mission statements of their companies. I think this is something that like has been at the forefront of conversation in our industry, especially in television, yeah. for some time. But um, when we were talking about it, 
you kind of bring this little bell for me because when for the last few years whenever we have written a character on a show that I work on that I just kind of know that the acting pool is not huge mm -hmm. because these are not necessarily actors who get a lot of work so there's not going to be five million of them um, I call the casting director like five months early yeah. and then I call the line producer and I'm like we're not budgeted for this we're certainly not budgeted to ship a you know person and they're perhaps their assistant if they need one from another country if we can't find them here right so we have to budget for this now um, so we were talking, can you talk a little bit about your yeah. process or the process of the shows that you work on? The process is that we've had to create a process. <laughs> um, and I've worked on four shows now that had to cast uh, indigenous characters when people said there were none, uh, which we know that's not true. Uh, we also know that they're not going to be in the casting director directories of casting directors. And so, um, you know, on Reservation Dogs, for example, to the credit of Sterling Harjo and Taika Waititi, who are the co-creators of the show, they didn't cast in LA. They went to Oklahoma, they went to South Dakota, they went all over the US in pockets where there were high concentrations of native people, which were, actually, were everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But they picked major cities and they, and they went out into these communities and they, they, they did auditions. And, and we ended up casting people who had never acted before. And I think it's looking at writers and actors and artists who have something to offer even if they're not working in the current context because they're still storytellers and I think as Native people like we're inherently storytellers like we're the original storytellers of this place and so <laughs> just because you don't have a script spec to show or just because you don't have a reel or you have never um, you know done a casting tape shouldn't discount you from the opportunity to tell the story of your community so you know for reservation dogs that was the process and it stayed that process every time we have to cast someone for that show we have an amazing casting director named Angelique Midthunder who really specializes in casting native characters if any of you guys are going to cast the people our people like she's great she's really great because what she does is she goes out and she looks at communities and we also are looking at Instagrams and Facebooks and we're putting out flyers at powwows and community centers. Um, I just did a, a show uh, up in Canada which is an hour drama and there was a scene that called for um, a large number of uh, indigenous background actors and in our casting meeting they were like oh I just we can't definitely can't get 50 maybe 25 and I was like hang on. <laughs> We're shooting in Toronto, which has one of the highest concentrations of First Nations people. Like, I just don't believe it. Like, I understand that it might not be in the background casting sheets that you have. I was like, but can you make me a flyer that I will put on my Facebook and my Instagram? Because we know everyone and I, you know, in the, the Native community, I will give it to First Nations filmmakers. And then we ended up taking flyers to a powwow and to like a community mm -hmm. center. And then we had an overabundance of background actors. So I think our show has sort of, um, not, I mean, not just this show, but this is also true of Rutherford. I also worked on Resident Alien. And in all of these instances, it's, it's caused, I think, um, everyone involved to realize we have to look at this differently. And even when it comes to hiring writers, you know, our shows are made up of poets and stand-up comedians and people who don't have traditional trajectories into writers' rooms. And I think that um, it's, it's kind of opening up the way that we you know, think of who who can sit in these rooms and who can be like on our sets. And I am I'm super proud of what we've been able to do because I mean, you have Reservation Dogs, which is like there's 11 native writers. There's like all of the directors are native, all the lead cast, all the extra cast. Like it's actually unusual when we have a non-native character. <laughs> like They're the ones that stand out. And I, I will say the last thing and then I'll stop talking about this. It just excites me so much. But you know, when we did our first table read for Reservation Dogs and it was every single person on that call was native. We're like, oh my God. We're like, is this how white people feel at work? <laughs> we were like, but it was, it was just like, because you know, so many of us had only been in every space we've been in, whether that's college or work or whatever, we'd only been the only one of ourselves. And you get to set and you look at it and you're like, oh, this is what it feels like to work with your friends and your community. And so that was only made possible, though, by rethinking the ways in which we cast and we um, hire writers and directors and so on. Um, that's incredible. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I don't want to <laughs> stop <laughs> But I, I did want to say, I mean, I, I thought what Tazwa was saying really highlights the intersectionality 
issue here because we went right from a discussion of Roe into this discussion. And to me, it seems it's, it's really uh, a good illustration of how those things are connected because being able to go, I mean, you were talking about how you need to be in Oklahoma to do what you're doing and being able to go to places outside of Los Angeles or New York uh, and be able to, you know, cast there, uh, have writers, directors, other crew from there, you know, expand those horizons is really important. And so to me, that's, that's one of the things that's jeopardized by the Rose situation, of course, because there are calls for, um, for productions to pull out of areas where the reproductive rights of all people are threatened. Um, and I think, you know, we, obviously we, it's yet to be seen what that's going to, how that's gonna play out. But I do think one thing the industry can be proud of is the fact that all of the industry organizations, and sag is certainly one of those, have stepped forward to make sure that there is uh, a certain level of protection for, in our case, performers, but in the case of directors, writers as well, so that if somebody is uh, working somewhere where they don't have full and full access to health care, and that doesn't only mean abortion, but it also, for example, includes transgender health care, that there is a, um, the, the industry health plans are covering travel expenses so people can go where they need to go. I don't think that's a full solution by any means, but I am pretty proud that that, that happened very quickly and there was a broad consensus, and, in, and I can only speak for us, but in our case, the, the major industry companies were there. You know, this wasn't something that where we had to drag them kicking and screaming across to do that. This was something where we put this forward and there was a great deal of support. So I, you know, it, it, we're still so early in this, in this period, but I do hope that we find a way to make sure that we can continue, um, and all of you as producers can continue producing projects wherever in this country they are. And I do wanna just say, there are some companies who are scared of uh, being attacked by right-wing politicians in various states or by prosecutors, things like that. And we have to get our heads around as an industry being willing to stand up to that because you know <laughs> we cannot let the lowest common denominator determine uh, the rights and protections of the people who work in our industry. And I, I think there is a support for that, but I know there are some companies that are scared. And so maybe if we all stand together saying that and repeating that, we can actually make that happen. Um, I want to keep this a round table and not get on another soapbox, but I do feel like I need to point out, just so we all know how fucking insane this all is, right? Yes, that we have to keep putting pressure, you know, uh, I'm part of a large group of showrunners that has been putting pressure because as you were just saying, as we all feel, we feel responsible for the safety and health. But the one thing I want to point out is it is so fucked up to have to tell your boss you need an abortion, to have to tell your boss that you're transgender. Like, that is none of your boss's business unless you want it to be. It's, an, it's embarrassing to ask for a tampon, <laughs> you know? Like, much less bring this thing that is really, con like, we've all been in human situations, I think, with friends, where it's like, do you want to talk to people at work about anything that might make you emotional? You're trying to be professional, especially, perhaps, as a woman, you're trying to be extra professional and not be seen as emotional because we still kind of live in that landscape where we have to do a little bit better than our male counterparts. I guess I'm like fully on a soapbox <laughs> now. Um, but there's just so much that's surreal about it. I mean, you know, Warren, you make a show about this that like, I, I think all of us who do development also have been experiencing that stuff that felt like fucking fables five years ago. Now we're like, oh, we might really just have a civil war we, in this country. We <laughs> would live to no longer be relevant. Um, if, if, uh, if we weren't relevant, that would be a really, really good thing. Um, um, interestingly, and, and I think the thoughts about hope and joy um, in terms of some of the vitamins and minerals that the audience needs um, in the time that we're living is absolutely true. Uniquely, since the insane decision by the Supreme Court, one million new viewers have come to The Handmaid's Tale who never, ever saw it before. And they, um, our imagery, of course, on news broadcasts across the world, um, when they're reporting on, on this historic decision um, and this travesty of justice, they use our image. And, and the audience, a million people had a hunger. That, by the way, that's just in America had a hunger to say, I want to find that content because I'm trying to understand. Um, so, so, And I'm searching for emotional catharsis. Yeah. Right? And, that there and, are feelings and there, and I, 
again, it goes back to why, you know, we have the privilege of doing what we do, you know, and what an important show you've made. Thank you. Um, part of a incredible group, all, all aligned with a vision from Margaret Atwood, written on a rented typewriter in Berlin in 1984, um, and um, taking historical fact and making that into a patchwork quilt of, of a world that she never wanted to envision, but she wanted to warn. Um, and so, yes, it's, um, it was scary in season one when, um, when we gathered um, and watched uh, Trump uh, win, win the election. Um, and, um, and it's been pretty horrible to see that we're more relevant today than we've ever been. Um, but I think that also motivates us and it creates um, a real strength and energy to all the artists that come together, even day players that come together and are a part of that experience. And, and I hope that um, we just continue to reflect that. But we feel it each and every day. Yeah, it's kind of terrifying, but thank you. Um, I'm going to switch slightly to some more business-focused questions. Um, given how much the industry has been changing, and in particular how siloed the business has become, can you talk about, Rich, we'll start with you, how you approach selling a project as a producer? It was really interesting that you're asking that question because, you know, traditionally I come from film world and very much now much more in the, in the independent space. And with streaming and the advent of streaming, there is a real kind of cross-pollination and the skills that um, and the storytelling process that one would tell in the feature space gets very easily translated into a limited series. And so that's something that we've been, you know, really been able to thrive in and the Genius Series is something that we've, you know, put together in that space. And I know you've done a, a lot of that, Lauren, as well. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's one of the ways that we're approaching how we're selling material. Is it helpful to just, uh, I'll just I'm going to fall and run with it? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> I, you know, for us, I think we really, the material is the thing. And so it's less about how are you approaching selling because selling is a very important part of the process, but I think it always starts with the sort of core question, do we love it? Right? That is for anybody at our company when we're evaluating material, we talk about the fact that the very first and most important question is, do you love it? And if the answer is yes, then the next question is, what's the best way to tell this story? Right? And that's if it's a book. If it comes to us and it's, just, it's a feature screenplay or it's a pilot, then we know, or if it's a play and we're talking about adapting it, then you know, that's the conversation that we're gonna be having. But, but with a novel, you, you kind of have a sense, is there a beginning, middle, and end? Does it feel like it is best told in an episodic format? What is the best way to honor this piece of work? Is it an ongoing series? Is it a limited series? And so it's really, but I, I think we try to start with, do we really love it? Because if we don't really love it, then somebody else should make it because they're gonna really love it. You know what I mean? I think, you, I think that the best thing that we can do for a writer, for a director, for an actor who's incredibly passionate about a piece of material, for an author, is to really love it and be committed to telling it in the highest and best way. And then the goal is to really find a partner on the studio or streamer or network side, whatever, that, whatever the answer is about what's the best way to tell the story, then the goal is to find the partner that feels passionate in the way that we feel passionate so that everybody is really galvanized to do this and to tell the story in the highest and best way that we can. And that is, I mean, we've had great flexibility in the marketplace in being able to go to everybody and have a conversation about a piece of material. And it's interesting because you do kind of know when somebody reads the book and they come to the table, I mean, Little Fires Everywhere was an incredible experience because we read that book and we loved the book. And Carrie Washington and her producing partner, Pilar, read it and loved it. Liz Tigelar 
I remember when she called me and she, she created the series for us, but she called me and she was like, I'm 150 pages in and I know I'm not supposed to say this and my agent is gonna kill me, but I have to do this. Like, I don't even know how it's gonna end, but I have to tell mm -hmm. this story, right? And so you, every single person came with this raw, instant passion. And so when we went out to the different streamers, what we said to them is, we love this book. So we want you to read this book. And if you love the book, then come into the room and we'll tell you how we envision the adaptation and we're excited to answer your questions, but we're not, it's not a conversation about what are we gonna do with it or like what's the, you know, it's really, we're, we wanna make this and we're really committed to it and we will tell you exactly how we imagine doing it, but if you're passionate about it, please join us and if you're not passionate about it, it's okay, but like let's, you know, and, and of course it was very moving that everybody read the book and everybody came to the table and everybody was very passionate about it and everybody came in. It's, that's how, you know, for an author like Celeste Ng, we knew we were doing right by her and we knew we were doing right by that book um, and by everybody. And, I, you know, so that is the most inspiring ideal process if it's possible and that's what we, that's what we strive for. Great, Warren, can I get you to uh, address I don't know that well? I can top that. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think it's just outstanding advice. I mean, the first thing we think about is what's the sandbox we wanna be in? Um, and is that play in the world of ideas, identify something that, um, what's it about? Um, and um, if any of you ever have the privilege and honor of working with John Langraff, you know that that's where his brain is. Don't tell me just about the character and story. Tell me what the thematic of this is. What is it about? And, and I think that you get to separate the um, things that you're passionate for um, because there are much easier ways to make a living. Um, and it takes tremendous passion and commitment to get it all the way there. Um, and, um, and then once you can coalesce around, well, this is what it's really about, then you start identifying the lens by which you tell that story and you're building partners. Um, you know, what I like to say to the artists I work with um, and the writers is that, you know, we're not the ones with vision. We seek artists that have a vision and it's our job to protect that vision help build it and protect it. And um, we, I, I think when we're doing our best possible work, we're able to get um, large companies who are writing very big checks to say, we trust that you can deliver this vision. Um, and, um, and that's what we try and do and that's very satisfying to us and that's kind of our process. That's great, thank you. Um, I'd love for actually all of you to address, um, I get constant phone calls about the disappearance of producers back end and the lack of profit participation. <laughs> so I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts about, not to put you on the spot, but. Uh, I'm not qualified to talk about <laughs> so I'll let you go down this path. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'll jump into the fray. Um, you know, I think the most articulate spokesperson about this has been Jeff Sagansky. Um, and he um, intelligently and passionately has rattled the cages. Um, once upon a time, there was a business that was in the television business, was dominated by networks. And they made original content and cable just lived off of reruns of uh, network shows. Um, and the world slowly started to shift. In that old paradigm, you could measure what success was. You could actually identify success and you could look very clearly at revenue streams. And those profit percentages um, were traced and were clear. Um, and we've been in this incredible revolution um, where the winner has been the viewer because we are in an age of infinite choice. Um, and that is daunting, overwhelming, exciting, it's wonderful. There are more choices that the viewer has than ever before. Last year there were 600 series made. Um, so in the new 
ecology of the world that we play in, um, the systems have been totally blown up. And so the companies that we work for are not quite sure even how to track what is success, how to define it, or even understand it because their world has shifted so radically. So in the world of ideas, wildly exciting because there's no more rules. And, and that old world that I grew up in had a lot of rules. Ooh, that feels good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. so tremendous opportunity. And yet, um, as I think Jeff Sagansky has passionately said, so if you break through, if you have a fog cutter show, break through, and it lands, what does that mean? And I think that 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 is an unanswered question in the environment that we live in today. And to add to that, it's very similar in terms of the feature space where so much is migrating from screen, big screen to small screen. And, you know, that is an open question of how do how do producers really um, win with success because of the the problems and well, I won't say problems, but the issues in terms of uh, evaluating what the process is for, for success. I will just say I appreciate the Producers Guild for this. We have a lot of Zooms and <laughs> it is talked about. I mean, it is, it does feel like it is a conversation that everyone is having. And I think it's, a, it's I mean, you can't top what Warren just said. I, I think we're in a moment where we're able to make a lot of incredible content and there are a lot of people that are passionate about making lots of shows. So all of these stories are being told, but I do think that um, producers are, are always sort of fighting for their place um, at the table and in terms of compensation and the work that we do is incredibly important. Um, and I think we are really trusted to do it. So I, it feels like it's a very live conversation and the thing that's been really inspiring to me um, as I've become more involved in the PGA is that there is a real community where people are talking about it and advocating for one another. Um, and there's, there's a real community and unity um, in an effort to try to figure this out and make sense of things and make sure that people are compensated for the work that they're doing. You know, it's not directly relevant to producers back end, but I think the broader, you know, from a broader perspective, uh, you know, performers, directors, writers share the same concern. And, you know, uh, some of the stuff that Jeff Zagansky has talked about is relevant to how the union structure um, residuals, for example, um, and some of it is, is really pretty focused on profit participation. But, um, you know, I think one thing we can all agree on is the question of how you measure success is so important. And it's one that the industry really still hasn't, hasn't gotten a handle on. And I expect it is something that will be the topic of, of real discussions between probably all of the guilds um, and the, the community, the, the, the companies, in the coming months and years. Oh. <laughs> the wind is blowing through. I feel, I feel like someone is... Uh, <laughs> I feel like the, the, that I'm being supported by, by Mother Nature. Uh, so I think that that's one piece. And the other piece is really, it's the same issue that we've experienced from the very beginning, which is why the residuals formulas that the guilds have negotiated are all gross-based. You know, it's, you've got to get away from an environment where uh, the companies can manipulate definitions of, of the metrics, definitions of whatever the success measurement is, if it's revenue, if it's subscribers, if it's whatever. You've got to get away from that into something that is really objective objectively measurable and transparent so that all of the creative people, including the producers on this panel and also all of our creative community, can have confidence that there's a fair compensation structure in place for everybody. And that, I don't think we're there right now and that's what we are all focused on achieving. And Sarah, do you wanna talk briefly about short orders, which I know is something that uh, <laughs> you care passionately about? I mean, all of these things are... They're all inextricably really tied. Related. It's just about how all of television has moved to streaming now. And I've been a writer for long enough that I struck in 2007. And at that time, there was still concern about getting our fair share of DVDs, which is a thing that used to exist. Um, <laughs> but even then, like, people were, you know, the, our leadership at the Guild was explaining to me that actually we were trying to lay the groundwork because soon it was all going to be streaming. And we all were like, what is that? Um, 
we used to have long, I mean, you've heard this before. You remember when there were 22 episodes a season for things, and now there are eight or 10 or maybe 12. But I do think we're in a period of transition in, in the BA <laughs> of every studio. And I think the transition probably needs to start to happen a little bit faster because the transition of how we receive our entertainment has just moved faster. So the standard contracts for a writer um, is that they uh, give a large amount of exclusivity to the staff that they're on. We have been incrementally trying to fix just span issues of the fact that we make shorter orders that take longer to make. Even if you're not in a pandemic, I took 22 months to make 10 episodes of You because we started in 2020. But even in you know normal conditions, it's it made sense when we were all making these other shows for broadcast network that we would say, of course, we're um, in first position to this show. We're not going to go do a bunch of other stuff because they need me for most of the year and then I need a vacation. Now writers have to put together their year. Tazba can speak to that too because she's in the middle of that process all the time. And they still kind of need to go ask for permission sometimes. And I think that that means that fundamentally we probably have to, we just kind of have to start over, I think, with the contracts the way that we contract writers. And we all have to hold hands and agree that this is how schedules happen now. And then we can have a separate panel about how writers never relax. <laughs> and it, they were, we didn't relax before, but now we really never relax because we have no hiatus. We're desperately trying to fill in those little squares all the time. Can I just say to that, I mean, sorry, I don't mean to be talking too much, but uh, that's what, I mean, we've been on a battle on this front on the actor side for three years. And uh, that included uh, getting legislation in the state legislature in California. We just concluded a deal with the AMPTP, which is the bargaining group of all the studios and streamers, as well as with Netflix, that fundamentally changes the way exclusivity is going to work for series regulars. And, um, and it's been very well received by our members, and rightly so, because this has been devastating. The, the development of this sort of streaming business model, hugely long hiatuses with all of this exclusivity and ability to get clearance to do other work, it's, it's really, really harmed actors. And, and I think it's harmed other people too, include, probably including producers from my conversations with Susan. So I hope that what has been accomplished there can maybe start to become more of a industry standard. We've got the idea of conflict-free windows where in every hiatus, uh, actors, series regulars can be entitled to go do other projects, have a specific minimum period of time so that they know another employer can count on it. It's not a, you know, I've got to go beg for permission. It's a, I know that I can rely on this and various other things too. So I, I hope that that can be a start to maybe setting up an industry standard that is more respectful of the creative talent who make all of these projects possible. Be pro-union, I think, is the bottom line of what you just said. But I mean, technically I'm in a guild, which sounds very like we wear berets and we're in the Renaissance fair or something. But none of this, like we wouldn't even be having this conversation if we didn't have strong unions protecting artists. Because um, artists, we want to do it and we would secretly do it for free and just starve, most of us. And while these huge conglomerates make millions and millions and millions of dollars. So just thank you. Yeah. At the risk of stating the obvious, obvious, you guys are all incredibly successful producers. But some of the people watching will not be quite as successful. And so I would love for each of you to give a short piece of advice of what advice you would give someone just starting out. I think be curious about where you're at and sort of looking at the gaps in information or skills that you feel like you want to fill or, or, or work on and I think that's always a good starting point is to be a sponge to absorb, to um, take your nose and investigate them rather than feeling defeated by them because there's always a lesson in them. Um, and I think also just like invest in yourself and invest in your craft and, and sometimes that means financially, sometimes that means how you care for yourself. Um, but that's, that's, what I, that's what I can offer at this time. Maybe in a few more years I'll have something different, but that's what I think right now. Yeah. Uh, I think the advice that, the, the best advice that I've received is follow your gut and really stick with your instincts. And if, if you're obsessed with a piece of material, if you're, you love talent, a certain director, just have that tenacity and drive and passion to just keep keep after it and much like you're saying is as a producer you cannot accept a no you have to push and push and push until you get that yes and 
Sometimes it takes 15 years to get something made <laughs> or create a relationship and at the end of the day it, it can be very fruitful and feel like a, a, a big win, um, not only for yourself but also for the creative people that you're working with. So that would be my advice. I'm like straddling being a producer and being a co-moderator. I'm a, I mean, I'm essentially a producer so that I can retain a little bit of creative control as a writer. So I had to learn how to talk to people who are in a room with me at the same time, which is not something all writers are born knowing how to do. Um, I, my, I, I say this to producers who are writers or are, are directors, artists in some way all the time, which is that the long view is crucial. So um, something that I learned from an acting teacher a long time ago was just to treat everything as practice. Because you will get fucked over sometimes. People will steal your ideas sometimes. Your show will get canceled unfairly. Um, so I try to put myself in that mindset of like, this is an experiment for the next thing. This is practice. So the next time I'm in this strange situation, I might make another choice. Um, it's put me on like a much longer view of like just my education as a writer and a producer, and that has helped me um, take things less personally and just have the, I think, endurance. A lot of this is just an endurance sport. I just, drafting off of what you said, I do think that learning from your mistakes and not seeing them as mistakes, but seeing them as opportunities um, is really key because we've all made so many mistakes, but I actually think that the most important learning comes at that moment of like, oh God, I can't believe I just did that. What am I ever gonna do? And then to actually sort of look up and be curious and try to figure out what is the bigger learning um, is essential. That was not what I was going to say. That was what I was inspired to say by you. But I, what I was going to say is seek out mentors and, and you know respect their time and know that it's valuable. And I'm not saying call random people and whatever, but you know, in your midst, identify mentors and be respectful of their time, but ask them questions and find opportunities to be helpful and useful to them. And just always be working and always be growing and always be curious. Um, and I think you'll, you never know where an opportunity will find you. Um, so, you know, just I think finding people who might lead you uh, a little further on your path is always a great start. I agree with all my panelists, um, be passionate. Um, but I, I guess the one headline I would say is do your homework. Because you're going into a buying situation as you're selling, right? And you want to look at the environment that you're in. Your buyer knows everything that's on all the competition. So, so much of the time, the upside is this is what's not being done. I see that. Uh, you know, in my life, uh, will and grace, right? I knew that relationship in the real world and television had ignored it. So that was an opportunity. So that's a way to identify what is the world you're living in, find your passion, do your homework, because the people you are trying to convince, they have done their homework. Um, and so be prepared, um, live in the moment, opportunities arise when you least expect it, but uh, be prepared. And I'm not a producer, but if it's okay, I have two pieces of advice anyway. <laughs> Number one is, you know, this is an industry where you have to deal with very big companies, and if you're on your own, if you're isolated, that's not a great place to be in. So if you're a producer, be a member of the PGA. Like, rely on the networks that you have that are there already to help you build strength and solidarity working together. I mean, that's what my members do, and that's how they achieve, you know, in many cases, um, what they have. And the second thing I would just say as a slight plug is, uh, we have a program called SAG Indy, which is a project that's specifically designed to help independent producers uh, figure out how to work effectively with unions, and specifically us, so that they can access talent and they don't have to feel like it's this scary big world that they don't know how to deal with. And so I just would encourage uh, anybody who might be uh, interested to reach out to SAG Indy. And by the way, they're not the union, they're separate from the union, so you can talk to them and you don't have to, you know, they'll talk to you and not tell us what they said or whatever, that's fine. But they're really there to help you navigate that. And I hope if you, if you think you might be able to benefit from them, please reach out to them. Thank you, thank you. Do we have time to take a few questions? Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Sorry, we tried one, to say more. The level of like cultural impact and tightness in terms of human beings and culture from this panel is unbelievable and really cool. So thank you all. Two, I love this conversation about back end. Warren, the idea that Tom Werner and Cosby Show now owns the Boston Red Sox or Jerry Seinfeld and these different elements, that is all gone. I've seen an industry for the business I've never seen a worse performing level of where we were 10 or 20 years ago in terms of the creators, the people that make the shit, actually benefiting from it. Simultaneously, the fact that Mark Zuckerberg can be in a dorm room at Harvard and create something that's worth double the value of Disney with Star Wars and all those different elements, that's a different framework. So I've had to go out with 25 Gen Z and millennials, and we have to help COVID testing companies make billions just so we can build our own development funds to build a pathway to be successful. We literally, it's easier to be more successful as a creator or a producer to go generate hundreds of millions of dollars in other sectors just so we can have the right to try to be a creator. And I got 25 young people that need to make a million bucks just to buy a home that's 800 square feet. So. I'm looking at all these young people, it's getting worse, it's getting harder. How do we go and fight up when the conversation about Amazon Prime and driving subs, and they don't even, they look at you guys as small tools to drive giant sales. You, I see us as creators being abused within tech companies and other things as small little players to drive, sorry, passionate about this. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying though is, what are we supposed to do to build a pathway when I'm looking at all these young people and how do they buy a home? How do they build a life? Because if you're that 1%, you guys are all getting squeezed, let alone all of that that trickles down below. So while everyone's getting rich in Silicon Valley or Google's expanding and Apple's buying, the creative community is getting squeezed for all those young people. Where are they supposed to go? What are they supposed to do? financially to survive, to be creators? I, I think you've identified a crisis of our industry and it, it could choke our future um, because it's essential that we have um, the next generation with their ideas, their life experience, have that bubble up and, um, and that content come from them. Um, so that's pretty scary. Um, I don't pretend nor would I insult you with any simple answer because it's not. Um, I think the more we talk about it, the more we illuminate it, um, that that's a beginning um, and I feel like that's all it is, um, a beginning. Um, if they have the benefactors in their life to somehow manage to stick it out, and you need that, you, you need help and benefactors. And those of us who have um, navigated through the system and, and um, have achieved have an obligation to, um, to identify that next generation and help them, um, uh, to give them a voice so that ultimately they can be part of what that future is. But it, it's, it's scary um, and we also, Worldwide economics, the what we're faced with in trying to create content in this environment, never been more pressure than what we face today. Um, I um, I spend a lot of my day um, trying to figure out how to how to build it and how to navigate through and still have the creative excellence that we desire for our content. I know we're short on time, but I mean, and it's not a simple answer, but one big part of that is what the unions do. I mean, the unions are not, like, we're not here negotiating to get the top 100 actors, what, I mean, that's what their agents do. What we do is make sure that the other 159,000 actors who are working in this country can make a, you know, a decent wage for the work that they do, notwithstanding how difficult this industry can be. And that's not just for actors. I mean, look at Amazon, look at Starbucks. I mean, this is, there is something happening in our country right now that needs to continue to happen. And that is people need to understand that 
we cannot let big corporations just dominate every aspect of our lives. And as human beings, we have the ability to work together to combat that. And so in this industry, that takes the form, I think, in a lot of, a lot of ways of the various unions that are each of them bringing people together to stand up to the big companies and to say, this has to be fair. And it doesn't solve all the inequality issues. It, it's not the panacea, but it is probably one of the best ways to actually take on these issues and see results happen. And I mean, that's proved out. And I, I hope our country is now turning a corner back into a world where we are going to have more unions because the fact of the matter is that, it, you know, if you're going to live in a capitalist environment, if you're going to have big, huge companies that control the means of production in our economy, people need to get together so they can stand up together and make sure that that is done in a fair way way. Our government's not going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it. We've got to take the power for ourselves. That's what the unions are for. So I hope that creative people realize unions are for them too. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a lawyer. When I used to work in the, in the, for the county of Los Angeles, we had a union as lawyers. It's not, this is not something where unions are only for certain people. Unions are for everybody who, who is a worker and who needs to get paid a fair wage and to have fair working conditions. And standing together, we can do that. I just want to thank everyone for a fantastic panel. <laughs> That was great.